Romans 8, 9. He says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So a major qualification of being a Christian is having the Holy Spirit. We can profess whatever we want, but if we don't have the Spirit of God, Paul tells us it's not genuine. Secondly, 1 John 4.20 1 John 4.20, if a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? So a second characteristic of a Christian is that we will love one another. This is the experience Ellen White spoke of of those who are ready to meet Jesus. This is Desire of Ages 641. Love to man is the earthward manifestation of love of God. It was to implant this love to make us children of one family that the King of Glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I've loved you, when we love the world as he has loved it, then for us his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. Now, the emotional oppressions I'm talking about get in the way of us loving one another. Because these emotional oppressions are creating anger in us and pride and critical spirit and judgmental attitude. And so it gets in the way of us truly loving one another. John chapter 12, verse 47 tells us why Jesus came. John 12, 47. Jesus said, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. I want you to notice this. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. We're to be like Jesus. We're not to be judging one another. We're to be used by God to bring salvation to one another, just like Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, there's an interesting statement by Jesus that points this out too. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why do you behold the moat or speck that is in your brother's eye, but consider not the beam that's in your own eye? Or how will you say... To your brother, let me pull out the moat, or a little speck, out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, cast out the beam out of your own eye, then shall you see clearly to cast out the moat out of your brother's eye. These emotional oppressions that we have are like beams. <laughs> in our eyes that make it impossible for us to really help our brother because we don't see him clearly. You see, God looks beyond our faults and sees our need. God is emotionally healthy. <laughs> when we're not emotionally healthy, and we have depression and anger and fears and doubts and critical spirit, we are constantly reacting to the faults of others. And it's impossible for us to see beyond their faults and to see their need and become therapeutic to them. See, that's Leo to see his problem. <laughs> They're not therapeutic. 
They're not able to bring life and health to those that they come into contact with. Jesus looks upon us with compassion, with compassionate eyes. When he sees us falling and he sees us struggling with anger and critical spirit and so forth, he's looking upon us compassionately because he sees beyond that. He sees our, our need. And he's there to help us with that need. And when we get healed emotionally, we will have the eyes of Jesus. We will be able to see one another compassionately instead of reacting to one another, reacting to the faults of one another. We'll be feeling compassion in our heart, the compassion of Jesus toward one another. And by God's grace, know how to help one another. We'll be able to confess our faults to one another, be able to pray for one another, and be able to be healed, as James said. And what I'm talking about in this presentation, as well as the previous one on emotional healing, will enable that to happen. Christianity is a relationship with a person, number one. It has doctrines, it has teachings, but above all else, Christianity is a relationship with a person, and that person is God. God is relational. And knowing that God loves you is essential to that relationship with him. And Satan has done everything he can to mess that up in your life and my life. He's caused us to get hurt as, as children and, and have conditional love and conditional acceptance and all that stuff. And so we project that on God because that's what we know in life. And he's done everything he can to get in the way of us experiencing God's love. But as we come to know deep in our heart that God loves us, then we will be better able to experience the full deliverance that God wants us to have and become like Jesus. Ephesians chapter 3. This would be the, the primary text, the foundation text for this study. Ephesians chapter 3. This is Paul's prayer for the believers in Ephesus. Ephesians 3.16 That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Remember, Jesus dwells in us and lives in us through the Holy Spirit. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able some other translation says, may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. He, his prayer for those, and he'd be praying that for us too, and this is God's will for us, is that we know the love of God for us. We know it beyond just simply head knowledge. It passes knowledge. It goes deeper than knowledge. It goes deep in our heart. And that's important because that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The more deeply we know God loves us, the more of God's presence we have in us. Like he says, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And when that happens, verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think, according to the power that works in us, the more we know God loves us, the more the fullness of God will dwell in us, and the more the power of God will be in us, and the more we will see things happen in our life that exceed our wildest imaginations of what God will be doing in our life to bring healing to us. Now, what does knowing God's love do for us? 1 John 4, 19. Simple little verse, probably know it by heart. We love him, referring to God, because he first loved us. What that text is saying 
is that you and I can only love God to the degree that we know he loves us. If my knowledge of God's love is intellectual, if you were to ask me, Dennis, does God love you? And I'd say, yeah. Well, how do you know that? Well, Jesus died on the cross. And I listen to things. But if it's simply intellectual, then I can only respond back to God in love on an intellectual basis. But the deeper it goes in my heart that I know he loves me, then I can love God back from the heart. So we can only love God to the degree we know he loves us. And that's what Paul was praying about. He says, I'm praying that you will know the love of Christ that goes beyond understanding, beyond knowledge. It goes deep in your heart. Because when you know that, some mighty powerful changes will start happening in your life. And then the same chapter, 1 John 4, and this time verse 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. We can only love our brothers and sisters to the degree that we love God. And we can only love God to the degree that we know he loves us. That's why there's problems at times in the church. When we don't get along with one another, when we don't really love one another as we should, it's evidence that we don't know the love of God deep in our heart. Because the deeper the love of God goes in our heart, the more we love God, and the more we'll be able to love one another. It's all connected. It begins on this level, and it works itself out on this level. And again, Satan knows that, and he wants to get in the way, every way they can, to keep that from happening. Obedience is the same way. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, if, if, if my knowledge of God's love for me is intellectual, then my love for him is intellectual, then my commandment keeping is intellectual. It's surface. But if I know deep in my heart God loves me, and I love him in return from deep in my heart, then my obedience to God will be from deep in my heart too. It's all connected. My loving God, my loving you, my obeying God, keep his commandments, is all founded on me knowing God loves me. It's at the core of all of it at the heart of all of it. And in 1 John 4, 18, he says here, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. The more deeply in my heart I know God loves me, the more of the fruit of the Spirit I'll be experiencing. Love, joy, peace, faith. I won't have fear. I won't have doubt. Mm -mm. Because I know deep in my heart my Heavenly Father loves me and I can trust Him. All of these things are connected together. Now the reason this is important on some other levels is when we struggle with sin. <clears throat> when a person struggles with with anger or eating disorders, um, alcohol, drugs, pornography, I don't care what it is, they are trying to relieve pain. They're trying to escape the pain through the flesh. It doesn't work. It may give a very, very, very temporary relief, but what comes later is even worse. And so these are, again, symptoms of deep pain in the heart. And they're trying to relieve that pain through the flesh. Trying to relieve that emotional pain. It won't happen. Now, the experiences that happen in our life, Satan brings negative things into our life, especially in childhood, to try to, to get in the way of us experiencing God's love. And so, in childhood, many times we get deeply hurt we experience, and, and all of us to one degree or another have experienced conditional love from our parents. Conditional acceptance. And that can cause us to have feelings of, un, un, of unworthiness and worthlessness and shame. 
And when that happens, it's human nature to develop self-protecting attitudes and behaviors. We don't want to get hurt anymore. So we're going to protect ourselves <clears throat> and to relieve the pain. Now I'm going to give you two lists here. Here are some self-protective behaviors when we feel worthless because of pain that we've had, especially in childhood. Anger, when circumstances seem out of control. Fear of emotion. Fear of experiencing feelings or getting out of control. Difficulty saying no to people. Fear of trying new things or fear of failure. Frequent depression. Compulsive sins or addictive habits. The need to succeed in order to be accepted. We might develop independent and self-sufficient behaviors to protect ourselves when we've been hurt. Here's some of those. Isolation and difficulty making close friends. Avoid getting into a position of need or dependence on anyone. Great difficulty asking for a favor or help. Being a much better giver than receiver. And when you do receive, you feel the need to repay immediately. Fearful or uncomfortable in a small group without either being the controlling leader or withdraw and not participate. Feeling tolerated rather than accepted. I know when I read that for the first time, I could see myself there some. And I got a feeling all of us can. Those are symptoms of deep wounds that are in our heart. <clears throat> we try to avoid further pain by putting up a shell around ourselves. And that shell <clears throat> keeps people from getting too close to us, but that shell also keeps us from experiencing God's love deeper than our heart, too. So it becomes a barrier. <clears throat> We may try to avoid the emotional pain in two ways. Through the flesh. And I mentioned that a moment ago. Alcohol, drugs, anger, whatever. They're feeling the pain, they want to escape the pain, and they go to the things in the flesh. <clears throat> or through religion, which becomes legalism. The idea there is if I can just obey God perfectly, finally I'll be accepted. That doesn't work either. Instead, it develops further problems. And I've seen some people go in a pendulum like that. They're in the church and they're in, into legalism because that's all they know is I can only be acceptable to God if I'm perfect and really obey God just right. Then he'll accept me finally. That doesn't work. And then they'll just give up and they go out in the flesh <laughs> and get out there. And there's a lot of guilt out there because they had the other. Then they go back here. I've seen some people go back and forth. And it's all based on the fact they don't really know God loves them. God's love in their mind is very, very conditional. Very conditional, because that's all they've known. <clears throat> we have the concept backwards. We think that if we can really overcome our faults, our sins, and our failures, then we'll have peace. That's not true. It's when we have peace through knowing God's unconditional love, that's when we'll begin overcoming our sins, and our faults, and our failures. And our, our hurts, <clears throat> our wounds, our pain can only be healed in one way. And that's experiencing God's unconditional love. Love is the greatest healing environment. The greatest one. Jesus had two very important things in his life. And I've read this text several times. I won't read it again. When he was baptized, remember, he prayed and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had that. And secondly, remember what the Father said? This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. That's the second thing he had. He knew his Father loved him. You and I need the same two things. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we need to know that God loves us. Even when we're messing up, <laughs> even when we're down in the pit of sin, we still know God loves us. That's the only thing that will allow us to get out. That's the story of the prodigal son, by the way. The only thing that allowed him to come back was at least thinking his father would be fair. 
At least he'd come back as a servant. You know, he had a little, his little speech ready. But remember, when he was coming back, while well, he was way off, the father saw him. <laughs> That's how God is. I don't care how far you're away from him, he's looking. And he's longing for you to come back. And the moment the son was coming back, you know, the father ran out there and met him, put his robe around him and brought him back in, full-fledged son. Everything was forgotten and forgiven. He didn't realize how loving his father was until he experienced that. That's one of the paradoxes of sin. Sometimes the farther we fall in sin and we realize God still loves us, the more we love him in return because we know we're so undeserving of that love and of being accepted back at all. <laughs> you, know. you cannot go so far in sin that grace won't meet you there. <laughs> I don't care where you've gone. God's grace is there to meet you and never think God doesn't love you. I don't care what you've done or where you're at. Never think that. So there's three things that <clears throat> we can do to cast down those strongholds that's in us, keeping us from experiencing God's love. One is to be filled with the Spirit. Because it says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will put love in our heart. Also, it's what I call listening prayer. <clears throat> That text we read earlier today in, in 2 Corinthians 10, he says he'll cast down strongholds. We have strongholds in us. What they are, they're hurtful experiences in our past. That's a stronghold that's becoming a barrier to us experiencing God's love. Now, we may not know what they are, but if you're having any of these symptoms, you got them. <laughs> you got these strongholds, these, these hurts, these wounds in your, in your life. <clears throat> now, God knows what they are. Now, when I went through the prayer of forgiveness with you in the last session, those are strongholds that you know are there. You know people that have hurt you. And in the prayer of forgiveness, you go through that prayer and, and you confess. You know, we command the spirit of anger, bitterness, unforgiving spirit to part. And you say, Father, forgive me for my anger, bitterness, unforgiving spirit. And then you say, Father, I forgive. So, you know, you know what that stronghold is. And you know what that wound is. And you, and you forgive that person that hurts you. I forgive my mother, my father, whatever. <clears throat> those are strongholds you know are there then. God's brought it to your mind. But there may be strongholds you're not aware of. And I've had people that <clears throat> have told me that, you know, they, they see the symptoms, but they can't recall anything. They blocked it. They don't know what it is that's in them that's, that's causing them to have this depression or this anger, this critical spirit. And so there's what I call listening prayer, where you can ask God to reveal the strongholds that is keeping you from experiencing his love. You can ask him to remove them, and he will reveal them to you. <clears throat> I can just share my own experience. When I first started understanding some of this, I, I said, well, I know, I, I knew I didn't, I didn't know God's love, and I'm still not there yet, believe me. I'm still wanting to know more, know, know more deeply in my heart his love for me. But I knew to a great degree my knowledge of God's love was intellectual. I didn't want it to stay that way. And I started asking God, you know, is there any, you know, strongholds in me? Show me if there's any that's keeping me from experiencing your love. <clears throat> and that's one of the greatest tragedies. God is so loving. And we know that's so little. That's a great tragedy. But that's going to change for that last generation. They will know the love of God more deeply in them than any generation that ever lived. <clears throat> so I began praying that prayer. And one day in prayer, I was praying, and I, didn't, I don't think I was even praying on that. And the Lord told me the story. By the way, I should say this. When I was six months old, I was adopted. Of course, I didn't know it at six months. And I didn't find out I was adopted until I was 23. And that's when I moved to and went off to seminary. So uh, I, I, I had a chance to meet my natural mother and my birth mother and my, and my birth father once. Um, met my birth mother numerous times, brother and sister and so forth. <clears throat> but um, I began praying to the Lord, and he began telling me the story 
of my adoption. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard his voice. You know, God will talk to us too, by the way. And he told me the story. See, when, when I lived with the, you know, and I had good parents. I've always thought I've had good parents. The Smiths were very good. I'm glad I had the mother I did and the dad I did. But they weren't perfect, as none of us are. And I remember growing up, <clears throat> they would say things like, um, if you don't behave yourself, we'll give you back to the Indians. Now, I'm a little guy, and I'm picturing some tribe out there. And, uh, <laughs> but I kind of push that under the carpet, don't think too much about it. And they used to say, and this sounds a little harsh now, but they'd say, um, you know what they do to bad boys? Uh, they, they, they go to reform school and they tie them to a bed and they beat them. So <laughs> I was a pretty good kid. <laughs> and so uh, that kind of thing went on. Not a lot, but I remember that. You know, I mean, they even say that a lot, but occasionally, I guess, because I remember it. When I became a Seventh day Adventist, they disowned me as a son. They took all the pictures down, there's no communication. In time, it improved, but uh, at the moment, that's what happened. And a couple other things took place. But my temperament's such that I just put that under the carpet. You know, I don't want to deal with conflict, so I just forget it. But I didn't realize that those things, even though you're not aware of it, it has its impact on you. What that is, is conditional love. And we transfer that to God. And so when I was praying one day, after I'd asked him, I don't know how many times, you know, occasionally I remember it, show me anything, anything there. One day I was praying to him, and he told me the story of my adoption. And he, and he said that when the Smiths brought you into their home, it, it was, they, they looked down on the family you came from. They felt superior to that family. <clears throat> and so they brought you into their home, and as long as you lived up to the Smiths' values and attitudes and, you know, Smiths' way of doing things, you'd be accepted. And so I was brought in somewhat conditionally in their mind. And, and so it became very clear to me the conditional love aspect of my childhood. And in that prayer, I forgave my parents for their conditional love and acceptance. And it brought tears because there was stuff there. And then God said, but Dennis, I loved you unconditionally through all that. <laughs> that brought tears too. <laughs> so God began working to remove that stuff. And then God brought to my mind my natural mother. And uh, I have a good relationship with her. I've, I've met her and many times and communicate. But I, I said, Lord, I forgive my mother for giving me up. And the Lord brought to my mind my, my natural father. And, I, and one day I, I, and I said, I forgive my, my natural father for, for deserting us. And for deserting me. You know, there's stuff in us a lot of times we don't know is there. But I'll tell you this, when you pray that prayer and God brings people to your mind, never write it off as insignificant. He's answering your prayer, and he's bringing you there. And sometimes that may be deeply emotional. You see, what happens when you go through these experiences, there's the pain there. And when you go there in prayer or in this process, you will tap into that pain. And you will, there will be tears, but it's releasing it. And God's with you in that, and he's bringing his healing love to where that pain's at. And... And so that's part of the process of being free. And so anytime God brings these things to your mind, uh, then you forgive those that have hurt you. And then you say again, Lord, I forgive them, and I ask you to forgive them, and I ask you to bless them. That's the process. And the healing starts taking place. And the healing's a process. Again, you may not be healed instantly, but it's a process of healing. And there may be others there that need to be dealt with. In our fellowship group at our home on Wednesday night, it's, it's been interesting. God's been kind of working with all of us in some of these areas. And I'll comment on this. Um, 
you'd be surprised how many women and some men who are in our congregations that were sexually abused as a child. There's a lot of sexual abuse. And Satan knows how devastating that is. That is terribly devastating to an individual when that happens. And I've, I've discovered that sometimes, and I won't say 100% of the time, but sometimes uh, fibromyalgia is connected with that because the pain is so intense that it can lead to the physical symptom of that. Not all the time, but sometimes it is. And in our group, <clears throat> one of the ladies in our group, uh, we're all pretty close to one another, and we pray for one another and deal with issues. And uh, I've, I've been showing a, a DVD set at church, which is especially for couples, but it can also be for singles. And it goes along somewhat along these lines, not exactly the same way, but somewhat. And so I have had a couple of Adventists call me who have read some of the books I wrote and asked if I was familiar with this particular individual and his, his teachings. I said no, so I looked at it. It looked pretty good. <clears throat> so one Sabbath, a few weeks ago, it was, this fellow was talking about, um, he used an illustration of sexual abuse, a, a lady that had been sexual abused and how she was being healed. And this one lady who was watching it, who's a member of our fellowship group, she... Um, Felt very uncomfortable watching that. She got up, went out to the kitchen, and came back a little later. And uh, that was on Sabbath. And it was either Saturday night or Sunday. I can't remember which. She told me. Uh, we got an email from her. And she said that for the first time in her life, she realized she'd been sexually abused. It was so painful that she had totally suppressed it. She said what happened to her was that, because she'd been praying this prayer, you know, God, remove anything that's in my life that would, that's a stronghold, keep me from experiencing your love. It's like God showed her a vision or something. She, was, she saw this little girl, about eight, and she said, that's my dress, that's my shoes. Then she started looking at the scene, and she realized it was in a barn, where she used to live. And she saw that her uncle was there. And God showed her up to the point, and he stopped it, of the, the act. And then afterwards, he showed her again and what the uncle had said. And it was devastating to her. She said later, growing up in her life, she always said to herself, at least... I was never sexually molested. And now she realized she had been. It was very painful. And she, she said she'd wake up with her pillow drenched in tears. And she'd wake up in the fetal position. The pain was so intense from realizing that. Now that happened on a Sunday and... and a, I talked to her on the phone, and we talked about it. And she knew about the prayer of forgiveness, because, you know, we've been going through these things. Been going through them with some other people, too, in the group. And um, she wasn't sure if she was ready for that, which I could understand. But by Wednesday, when she came to the group, she decided, I want to get, get over this. And so we went through the prayer of forgiveness. And she was able to release it totally, and be free. The shame was gone, the loathing, the anger, the bitterness. God moved in. And what, and also she, she described, she said she could now look back at her life and see why she related to certain situations as she did. Where before she didn't understand why she reacted in certain ways, but now she knew. And she described it, and she said, it's like my heart's opened up more than it's ever been. And I'm experiencing a level of life that I hadn't experienced before. So this thing was in her, suppressing and, and creating some, some negative stuff in her life. And she wasn't even aware of it. 
what happens in these kind of situations, whether it's sexual abuse or severe emotional abuse, physical abuse, whatever, when it happens to us, it does severe emotional damage. And from that point in our life, it colors everything else we do. It affects everything else in our life. Now, God understands that. And it causes us to behave in certain ways. That's why, again, God looks beyond our faults and sees our need. Praise God for that one. <laughs> and he wants to heal us of that. And that's why when we're healed, we can have the same compassionate eyes of Jesus and not be reacting all the time to the faults of others, but again begin realizing there's a deep need there. There's a deep hurt there. We can see them with compassion. And so what happens when we go through that terrible experience, say as a child, it, does, it affects everything in our life from then on. And when the healing comes, God takes us back there. And I've seen in, in our prayer group, there's another lady that, it's interesting, God's brought the folks together in that, and several of the ladies in that group, we didn't even know it, had experienced sexual abuse. And one of the ladies, you, the struggle of going back there, and you may find yourself there, you may, just, you may say, I don't want to face the pain of that. Whatever it is. But you don't have to be afraid of it. God will be with you when you go there. And yes, it'll be painful. But what happens, it releases the emotional pain. And now God's healing love comes. And it's, as, as the best way I can describe it, it's like you go right back to that moment, you release the pain, you're healed, and you start life again. And from then on, it no longer colors your life. And you, then you're back here now where you were, and that pain's healed. Another lady who had experienced a similar experience, I could sense in the group she was having a very difficult time. She did not want to share. She hadn't told anyone but maybe one person, a lady friend of hers. <clears throat> and, but God was moving and moving week after week. And one night she just had to <clears throat> say something. And we went through the prayer she got it out. We went through the prayer of forgiveness, and she was released. That was on a Wednesday night. And the next Sabbath, when I saw her, she was so filled with joy. And she said, you know, I used to hate that man. Now I feel compassion. Now, that's a miracle of God <laughs> to feel that towards somebody that did such a terrible thing to someone. But that's starting to get the eyes of Jesus. That's why Jesus said... As long as the beam is in our eye, we won't see clearly. But when we get the beam removed from our eye, then we can truly see clearly and help our brothers and sisters remove the specks that are in their eyes. And God wants to use us that way. He wants us to be so healed that we can truly confess our faults one to another and pray for one another and experience complete healing. That's the book I wrote on spirit baptism and new wineskin fellowship. That's what that's all about. Is, and I long for the day when we have that kind of fellowship taking place with our believers around the world. The body heals the body. You know that's true in the physical realm, right? God gave you an immune system. You get a bacterial infection. You get a virus or something. The body will go to heal it, you get a cut, if you're healthy, you get a cut, it'll heal, the body heals the body. The same is true with the spiritual body of Jesus. The greatest healing should be taking place in the body of Christ. The greatest spiritual healing, the greatest emotional healing, and the greatest physical healing. Now, I'm not against doctors and things like that, please don't get me wrong, <clears throat> because God will use medical science to help us. But, um, I will say this, on the emotional level, it does not take weeks and months and years and years to be healed. Our Jesus can heal you quickly, <laughs> very quickly. And I've seen it, like with that one lady, 
Well, all of them, each one of these folks that's in our group and others that I've, I've seen outside, that lady I read to you her testimony, these people were delivered instantly from the power that, that Satan seemed to have there. They were free. Jesus meant what he said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And that's why I say that generation that's living when Jesus comes, I'm awed by it. They are going to be so free of any and every oppression of Satan, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. I want you to remember these things of God's attitude towards you. You know, by the way, if I were to ask, maybe I will, (laughs) how many of you never heard your father say, I love you? That's not surprising. Many of us are in that category. But your Heavenly Father loves you. Here's what he says to you. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. Did you know that? Your Father is delighting in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. My son, my daughter, I love you. You're precious to me. You're the worth, the life of Jesus to me. I'm so proud to call you my son, my daughter. Let me wrap my arms around you and love you. You're secure in me. No one can shake my love for you or the destiny which I have planned for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? No. And all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And my prayer for all of us is that we will experience deep, deep in our heart that God loves us. That's at the heart of everything. Everything I've said today and and, and yesterday, if we can experience that, that will be at the core of everything else. And we will be victorious when we understand then the weapons of our warfare. And through it all, we know that God loves us. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Father, I thank you, Lord, for loving us Oh, Lord, it's such a tragedy that we know so little of your love for us. But, Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you remove every stronghold that's in our heart and life, mind that's in us, that's a barrier to us from experiencing your love deep within us. Remove them, Father. Show us what they are. May we be free of these things so that we can know deep in our heart your love. And then I know, Father, we will have no fear. We will be filled with joy. We'll be filled with peace. We'll be filled with faith. Our relationship with you will be a relationship of love. We will love you with our whole heart. And then I know, Father, we will be ready to go through the final crises and meet our Lord because I know then we'd be willing to lay down our lives for one another and we'd rather die than dishonor you. Bring us to that point, Lord. I know that's your will. In Jesus' holy name, amen.